first of all, you were invited to screen this at the White House. And the reason this is important is because when people make documentaries, they're so important. And the only hope is that, that it reaches some people. That's right. And what a hope that it reaches some people who might yeah. be in a, a, a position to make decisions. So yeah. what was that all about? We always wonder whether we do these things. There's going to be like a tree falling in a sure. forest, yes. right? And yes. in this case, it was very gratifying to see that the biggest, the most important office title, if you will, the biggest building said, this is a narrative that we need to share with America, that yeah. we need to show this movie at the White House. I call it the most exclusive movie theater in the world, right? right. 42 seats. They don't show a lot of movies in that place. The first lady standing at, in the East Garden with all of these community leaders saying, yes, we care about mental health. We care about our military community and we care about the care economy. Mm -hmm. That's important. And, and that's why with AMC theaters and now MSNBC and all the rest saying, yes, this is something we need to talk about on the cultural side, because they understand the gap that we are living in. Let's just talk about something that um, you bring up in this documentary, and it's about taking care of yourself in order to take care of someone. Let's just talk about Alzheimer's, for instance. Yeah. There, there's a point at which, as we live longer... Uh, once you get into your 90s, the percentages are that half of all people will have it, which right. means the other half are caregivers. Correct. If you're lucky enough to just have one partner have, have Alzheimer's, yeah. which means, I mean, this is really complicated financially, emotionally, and mentally, even for people who don't require the care, the people who are the caregivers, including yourself. Yeah, and the, uh, just to dig down to how many people are going through that, it could be 53 million, according to AARP. It could be up to 100 million until, according to the Caregiving Action Network. That's a lot of Americans right. going through this. The value of the care that they are providing, untrained, mind you, mm -hmm. untrained, yes. is worth half a trillion dollars a year. That's in addition to the loss that you were talking That's about. That's what I was going to say. That number doesn't include the labor, the actual labor. That labor that is yeah. untapped. It is the most common job in America, yeah. yet we don't talk about it. It's unknown. And so do we need to take care of caregivers? Do we need to take care of ourselves? Yes, we do. It's very important. It's, it's, uh, so, for instance, my mother, I call it the scream. I was, we have cloud cameras. I watched how she was screaming at my father. It's a scream of not only help, but pain mm. and hurt. And we don't want our caregivers to go to that point where they go over the edge. And so we do need to self, not only s take care of oneself, but also put in place systems that will help caregivers. And what we're seeing is that government, in a bipartisan way, for instance, the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, and you know Elizabeth Dole very well yeah. in what she has stood for, as well as those on the left, Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell, coming together as co-chairs for these sorts of films, including Unconditional and Sky Blossom before. So we're seeing the effort there. It clearly is a push-pull conversation when we have enough time. <laughs> uh, I would like to. We, we, we will make time because it's important. One of the things I, I, I remember first hearing about this many years ago, the concept of mental health equivalence. Yes. Right? The idea that if I feel like I'm getting a little bit sick, certainly in, in COVID times, you could just call up and say, I can't come to work. And everybody's like, yeah, stay home. Don't, don't make me sick. Mm -hmm. You can't do that with, with mental health. Yes. You, you really can't call point. up and, and say, Very it's not point. really feeling like myself today, yeah. so I'm not coming into work. People don't take right. that seriously, nor is it easy to get help for that. If, yeah. I, if I'm feeling a little yeah. uh, scratchy, I get on my phone, I can find a doctor in about right. 10 minutes, uh, prescribe me something, right. get, to yep. the, get to the pharmacist and get it. Yep. That doesn't exist for mental health in the way that, that it does for non-mental health. That's issues. right. You can get on to a web doctor and have that solved pretty quickly now today after COVID. You can't do that with mental health issues. First of all, it starts with a misperception that mental health equals mental illness. Yep. It does not. 80% of those cases are something in between. Number two, we perceive it to be not like physical health. Like I say when I've had mental health, now that I have a better understanding of it, my brain's feeling a little chubby. Yeah. It's feeling a little chubby, just like after mental health, uh, physical health situations, you're a little chubby. Right. Where do you go? You go to a coach. In this case, it's a therapist. We do not look at them the same way. Yeah. And therefore, culturally, because we don't, those mechanisms that you're talking about are not as easily accessed along the way. So we have to change or, and this is why this documentary I thought needed to be made, the cultural conversation. Mental health yeah. is not always wrong. It can also be strong. I learned that from a 13-year-old that said, Richard, you got to stop talking about mental health as a weakness. Yeah. you got to start talking about it as a strength, potentially, too. Thanks for doing this, my friend. I really uh, appreciate Allie, it. Allie, always great talking to you. My friend, friend Richard yep. Louie. Uh, you can watch Richard's new documentary, Unconditional, tomorrow night at 11 p.m. Eastern, right here on MSNBC.